And then the final thing uh, are uh, the main principles of using medications. It's ideal for using antidepressants and not these sort of minor tranquilizers like benzodiazepines. Now, it is uh, certainly reasonable initially because some of these antidepressants take a little while to kick in uh, to maybe use something to help patients, you know, while they're experiencing problems of sleeping, you know, or problems with sleep. So if they're having insomnia, in that case, it might be okay to use some type of an agent to help them sleep for a short while until the medication starts kicking in in terms of these other types of antidepressants. But we wouldn't want to continue them on, and we wouldn't want the minor tranquilizer or things like that to be the only treatment that we're providing for them. And when you say initially, what do you mean by that? So usually in about the first six weeks or so, four to six weeks would be appropriate. So if we're, so, the main type of medication that we'll be talking about are these uh, SSRIs or uh, uh, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors. And so we know uh, that uh, some patients will respond very quickly to them, but uh, for the most part, we see uh, people responding sort of about four to six weeks uh, after uh, getting appropriate doses. And uh, during that time, while we're waiting for those effects to really kick in, they might still be experiencing sleeping problems, and it might, you know, it might severely affect their daily routine. So, you know, if somebody's having insomnia problems, you know, and they're just t fatigued all the time at work, well, we need to do something in the interim. We, should, we don't want to wait until four to six weeks when the medications uh, are, start working. So at that point, it would certainly be appropriate to use something else to help with that. But at some point when the medications are working, they shouldn't need that anymore. Um, we want to make sure that we're using adequate doses for an adequate amount of time, and we'll talk about that. And then uh, we also want to start slow and work with side effects, but we also want to make sure that we're increasing the doses so that we get to an effective dose um, as, uh, because otherwise we're just going to be stuck at that same low level. And the final thing is that if it's not working, at some point we just have to say, okay, this is sort of the time point. We've got to switch course. This is, you know, we, you don't want to continue on ineffective therapies. And so usually after about eight to ten weeks, um, at that point, if things, if there really hasn't been much of a change at that point, it would be reasonable to try a different type of medication or to try a different modality of treatment. Uh, just to, just to, I'm, I'm going to make a quick point about this. Um, he did a really nice job of explaining it. The, the big mistake that primary care physicians make is inadequate dose for an, for, for an inadequate amount of time. Mm -hmm. So w one clear example, and we'll go through the dosages later, um, is so for I don't know if people are familiar with Prozac, mm -hmm. but it goes from zero to sixty milligrams, mm -hmm. and they'll say it's ineffective even though it's been on ten milligrams for six weeks, right? And that's a big problem. Um, so you want to make sure. And actually, the person who ends up, I think, a lot of primary care physicians, except for Michael, because he's a super primary care physician. <laughs> he, you know, most of them. Um, I think a lot of who are just not as trained, they just they they they, ha they haven't been trained it properly. They rely on the social workers and psychologists to really help them out and ha figure out what to do with this. You know, it's it's reasonable to go up on the medications fairly aggressively if the person doesn't have side effects. Which takes me back to my earlier question: oh. How does the patient know when this medication is working? Because here you have the tranquilizers. Well, you know, uh, what I often have found when I've been working with patients who are taking antidepressants and going through depression, they often come to the sort of realization, you know, things are, things are not as bad. I'm, I'm able to cope with things better. You know, it's not all the way better, but I'm able to cope. And, you know, before, when they first come in, they're just a mess. You know, there's just all sorts of problems going on. They're, they're just not sure where to even begin. And so I think that once you start seeing that change, that starts suggesting that uh, things are getting better. Um, the other thing I would mention is that uh, what uh, Bowen mentioned is something I see all the time. It doesn't matter what clinic I work in. I, I see patients who, you know, uh, are on uh, Paxil paroxetine, 10 milligrams. And, you know, what often happens is the doctor who has come in to take care of that patient will say, well, you know, I'm coming in to take care of this patient for the first time. They've been on these medications for a while. We'll just continue them. Things seem to be going okay. Of course, they never really ask about depression, you know, or get a sense of how bad things are really going. Um, but, you know, they, they just tend to continue on what they've seen people use before, and they 
feel very uncomfortable about changing something unless they see something tangible that they feel comfortable about. So, for example, with blood pressure, you know, if they see that the patient's blood pressure is now a number that they are familiar with, instead of being 120 over 80, they see a number that is 180 over 100, they'll say, okay, maybe I need to make a change. With depression, when people feel uncomfortable about it or, or, or is not as familiar with it, if there's not something that, for example, a doctor may say, I can hang my hat on saying that there is this certain threshold where I know that, yeah, they're having symptoms, but it's gotten worse, you know, should I make a change in the medication? Um, you know, usually with primary care providers who are less familiar with using some of these standardized instruments, They'll just sort of say, well, seems like, you know, I, I'm a little unsure. I don't really want to change course. You know, I might make things worse. We'll just leave it as is. And, again, that's what we don't want to have happen. So by using something like the PHK-9, it provides something that makes a provider a little bit more comfortable in terms of saying, well, you know, symptoms have changed. I can really see that, you know, before this patient, you know, when they did this PHQ-9, their numbers were, let's say, 10. And, you know, now these numbers are 20. It seems like something is different, something is wrong, and I need to do something different, and, you know, and if they're on these medications, they could certainly increase the dose. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, is that the PHQ-9 score, especially if you keep track of them, they're, they're nice because it, people forget how they answered three weeks ago, so people can look at it, and some places will even graph it out. Um, so I think that that's a nice way to sort of convince people because it's interesting. I mean, you know, because with depression, actually, moods less your your self perception of how you're doing is actually the last thing to change in general on these things. So people will move better, they'll function better, they'll sleep better, but their self, their perception of how they're doing is not as good uh, is the last thing to change. So we'll go to the so, so it's good to actually. We there are a lot of really um, there's a lot of choices with antidepressants, and that's a wonderful thing. So. Everybody's familiar with the SSRIs, the serotonin-specific reuptake inhibitors. They've been around for a long time, uh, I think like 1980, so we're getting close to 30 years, right, with Prozac. Um, fluoxetine, paroxetine, I'm just going to go through the generics, citalopram or Celexa, uh, sertraline or Zoloft, uh, fluvoxamine, um, Luvox. Uh, there's also now Lexapro or escitalopram, which is still on patent. Um, uh, there's the newer antidepressants. Uh, well, they're actually not so new anymore, like Welbutrin or Bupropion, Mirtazapine or Remeron, uh, Benlafaxine or Effexor or Duloxetine and Cymbalta. And then they're tricyclics, you know, like Amipramine, um, Doxepin, Dizipramine, Amipramine, right? So everybody knows these things. Um, the, the TCAs aren't actually recommended for older adults, and actually I think most people will stick to the SSRIs or uh, the newer antidepressants. Um, just one thing about these medications that I'll mention is, is that a lot of these medications, and this is good for people to know because once the doctor prescribes it or making suggestions, is that a lot of them are actually available as generics now. And I think that this has really lowered the access. But I work, I work at Harbor, and I work with a lot of people who don't have phones or homes. And, you know, some of them don't have insurance, and the county won't pay for the medications. And uh, even a homeless person can figure out how to get 4 bucks a month for some, of the, for some of the prescriptions out there, like at Target, Costco, Walmart, uh, Ralph's. And you can get fluoxetine a month of supply for, for 4 bucks. So it's pretty remarkable, or citalopram even. Um, depending on the pharmacy, you know, they'll have different different options. Wellbutrin even, 